His hair and skin were still damp from the water as they sat and ate on the warm sand. He felt the heat and he smelled the smoke from the smoldering fire. His mind, his eyes, and even his stomach could not make sense of the meal they were eating and all that had come about that morning. Peter would have laughed in the face of anyone who had tried to put into words what had just transpired. But he experienced it himself, seen it with his own two eyes, and still had the goosebumps to prove it. He could still feel the weight of the nets on the other side of the boat. Too many fish for their weary hands and body to haul in after a long night of nothing. Not catching, not seeing, not feeling. Now the shock of his presence on the beach eliminated every fear. Peter faced the wind, jumped in the water, swam to the beach just to be there in the Lord's presence. Drying off now around the fire, eating some of the fresh fish, all of it was just secondary to just being in his presence. It was enough. More than enough. Jesus, the risen Lord, with Peter and his friends and fellow disciples eating and resting in his presence that morning. Their physical hunger now sated, their minds and hearts just slowed down a bit to match the steady rhythm of the waves lapping the beach. And that's when the question came, came in like a tide. It eased in, slowly settled, and abided with them. Peter, do you love me? It seemed to come out of nowhere, and yet so obvious, so basic. After all they had been through, and now he is asked questions seemingly just out of the air. Peter, with his friends circled around him, couldn't help but reply with the words stumbling out, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. His simple reply, Feed my lamb. The question and the reply hung in the air, dancing and swirling in their minds and hearts like the smoke in the air from the sea coming in. The words simple and basic and apparent, but left them wondering, is there more to this? Jesus broke through their thoughts and asked again, Peter, do you love me? Now the words dropped in his lap. Now with more weight, and Peter did all he could to reply with more assurance, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. His basic reply, Tend my sheep. Now as the wind rushed across the coals, sending sparks with the smoke, Peter heard and felt at the same time his question. Peter, do you love me? And the words snapped his steady response and left him raw, raw with emotion, raw with exposed frustration, disappointment, shame, and hurt. Peter hurled his reply in hopes of finally being heard. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. His reply to the myriad of complex and genuine emotion, feed my sheep. On that beach in Galilee, the risen Lord came to the disciples one last time in the Gospel of John, sitting together one last time. Consider all the questions Jesus could have asked Peter. 
I mean, Peter was Jesus' ride or die disciple throughout the Gospels, except when it really came down to dying or lying, right? Because then Peter denied him three times. And given they were so close, so long a history of serving, of arguing, of living on the road together and doing ministry, why did Jesus ask this question? Well, we have so many complex questions, I do for sure, that I'd like to ask Peter. Why did it come down to the basic question all three times? The basic question, Peter, do you love me? Today we end our sermon series on going back to the basics with John Wesley, who is the founder of Methodism. And his three simple rules, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. It seems Wesley's on to something that Jesus asks Peter. And perhaps Jesus is asking us today, do you love me? The third and final rule, stay in love with God, was in no way the last in importance. Instead, I think that maybe Wesley was saving the best for last. For John Wesley, staying in love with God was essential and sustained the other two rules, do no harm and do good. I mean, I love how Reuben Job, in his little brown book, states it. These first two rules, they're important. And they bring immediate results, for sure. But without the third rule, staying in love with God, the first two become increasingly impossible. Staying in love with God is the foundation to all life. It is vital in our relationship with God that we are living, sustained, called, set forth, and transformed. The third rule is vital, and it holds us up to the task of the other two. For John Wesley, staying in love with God was essential to faithful living and part of everyday life. It was not something just kept for Sunday morning and a to-do list of, of the worship that he needed to do, but very breath and focus for every day, every day, in every situation and relationship. Staying in love with God made the other two rules, do no harm and do good, sustainable and also possible. Now what I love about this third rule, stay in love with God, is it really is the good news for all the other rules. Because over the past two weeks, we've been mulling over those two other rules, right? Do no harm and do good. And each time, they seem real simple to say. But once we scratch the surface, go dig deep into them, we realize and we start reflecting on it that it's a lot more complex and challenging than just saying it. I mean, really, doing no harm these days seems almost impossible given our ecological crisis and the daily injustices and suffering that we see in our own communities. And doing good seems almost elusive when we want to protect ourselves, we're afraid of suffering or being hurt or manipulated. These two rules are truly easy to say or preach, but way, way more challenging to live out in everyday life. And yet the good news is found in a third rule, stay in love with God. Because this rule, although it may seem a little odd or vague into our ears or hard to quantify in practicality to our mind, but to our heart and to the soul, it is the easiest and most simple to follow. Truly. In fact, you and I are created, we are made to do this rule in the most genuine and unique ways. When we follow or live this rule, it becomes the way we live, inside out. We live inside out through love. Loving God leads to love of one another. Do you love God 
is the last repeated question Jesus does in the Gospel of John to Peter and to his other followers. He directly links it to his reply, though. Because what was Jesus' reply that every time he says, Peter, do you love me? You remember? Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Feed my people, tend to my creation. Loving God is a central theme of our passage from the first letter of John that we read today so beautifully by Fritz. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. This short passage of just four verses in the beginning of chapter 5 is only the tip of the iceberg, I promise you, of what you may need to hear in your heart today. To me, only hearing a little part of First John, this short letter, is almost like eating just the skin of a red delicious apple. Because if you don't read it all, you're missing the whole meat of the apple. The first letter of John is truly a love letter that is deeply moving and transforms the way we stay in love with God, in my opinion. I encourage you to read it this weekend as a gift to your heart, a spiritual discipline to stay in love with God, just to open up 1 John. It's a short letter. It's only five chapters long. And it truly can transform the way you love and the way you live out this simple rule to stay in love with God. There's so many familiar passages in 1 John you may have heard before, like God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And then in chapter 4 it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And just before our reading, at the end of chapter 4, right before we picked up, those who say, I love God, and hate a brother or sister, are liars. Wow. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, the commi- cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The commandment we have, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. There is that connection again. Jesus making that connection with Peter on the beach. John Wesley making that connection with his church in the Methodism. Do we see the connection of these three simple rules to loving and living out our faith? Because when we hear these verses, remember uh, Jesus' questions and reply to Peter, it is obvious that John Wesley's three simple rules are essential to faithful living. To do no harm, to do good, To stay in love with God, they're interconnected, interwoven, and depend on each other. So how? How do we stay in love with God? Well, of course, John Wesley has a method for that. (laughs) We are United Methodists, and that's why I love being United Methodists, because he really thought this through. And now, full disclosure and explanation, I want to make this clear, too, is that Reuben Job, and we've been using this, I've been using this book as a guide for my sermons, he has interpreted the third rule as stay in love with God. John Wesley phrased it a little differently given his context in 18th century England. And so if you looked it up in our book of discipline, yep, we have a book of discipline, and you look it up, you would see the three rules phrased as by attending upon all the ordinances of God. Now, Bishop Job and I and you probably know that these words are not quite fit into our everyday vernacular or what we're used to hearing. So what Reuben Job did was he looked at the meaning that John Wesley was going to in this statement. John Wesley used this phrase, ordinances of God, to describe the practices 
those practical ways to keep the love alive between us and God. Another way to consider the ordinances or practices to stay in love with God is also called spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are those acts and promises, those practices that teach us to live our lives in harmony with something larger, something bigger than what the world values or sees. You see, spiritual disciplines connect us to the healing compassion of love that is the presence of God. Remember, we just heard aloud in 1 John, God is love. And so the spiritual disciplines are how we stay and abide in that love. Spiritual disciplines guide us in a very practical way to hear and receive God's presence in every situation. And through discipline, meaning doing it over and over becomes a habit, we can trust in God's love and presence. You know, John Wesley understood the breadth and depth of these spiritual disciplines. They truly are wide and diverse. To stay in love with God, they have to be. Wesley saw how these disciplines kind of fall into categories, so he knew it was a both and, not an either or. It was both individual, done on your own, and also communal. So he uh, told communities to go and worship together and to celebrate and gather at a table in communion, and yet take time by yourself also to read scripture, to pray, to be in meditation and contemplation about God and your connection to God. And then Wesley also saw that staying in love with God was both inward and outward. It's not one or the other. Think about living inside out. Now, he described this, it might sound familiar, he's described this as works of piety and works of mercy. And it's basic to our faith as United Methodists. The inward piety, the inward actions of prayer, Bible study, hymns, and then that's works of mercy, those outward acts, acts of compassion, acts of service, to be with those who are grieving, to be with those who are in prison, to care for my sheep. They go together, inward and outward. All those, both communal and individual, are spiritual disciplines that keep us in love with God and one another. Now, as we end or going back to basics, I hope, my hope is that your imagination is sparked. The interest and the possibility of spiritual disciplines as United Methodists is sparked. Let Wesley's example and the Gospel of John inspire you to find new ways to stay in love with God. Spiritual disciplines are as unique as each one of us. And it amazes me how quickly I go, instead of imagining new possibilities, to just comparing with others. Because we really are only a limited, or we're only limited by our own comparisons and fears to connect with God. The third, the third rule to stay in love with God is so simple and unique to you that there is no need for comparison with others. Jesus leaves it wide open with Peter, right? I mean, he said it, feed and tend my sheep. That's simple. He could have said, Peter, divide up all those fish and just equally divide them on this map and hit these towns as you go and make sure you get it done by noon. And he could have said, hey, do it bigger, better, stronger, and with a smile on your face compared to all the other disciples. But does he? So why do we? Why do we compare ourselves? He left it simple, basic. Feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. And then he opened it to Peter to take it and run with it. And he did. It's your turn, friendship. Take these three simple rules and run with it. Stay in love with God 
not by doing the same thing over and over and over, but allow yourselves to be transformed by it. Your spiritual disciplines will change over time. And as we are formed and transformed by the Holy Spirit, we will change also as a community. Because we come to a table for communion each Sunday, and we celebrate in a public way, a way that shows that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. Jesus came to the table that night. He knew that the disciples didn't fully understand the whole capacity of what was about to happen, that he was going to the cross. He knew that he would be betrayed. He knew that Peter would deny him three times. And yet with that knowledge of sin ahead, he raised up his broken body. He broke the bread, gave it thanks to, it, thanks to God, and then he shared it with the disciples, saying, this is broken for you and broken for all. Do this, eat of this, and remember me. And then Jesus took the cup, the cup of salvation, and he told his disciples, this is my blood broke, shed for you and shed for all. It is of the new covenant. Drink of this and be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. In this, we become a holy and living sacrifice. We become the body of Christ and one another. So together, let us be one for one each other and allow the Holy Spirit to be present as I ask, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.